My name is Mel Scahan. I'm an enrolled Yakima member of Central Washington. I am in my mid-50s. I've worked forestry for the last 35, 36 years now. And I started my forestry career down in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest on the west side of Mount Adams. It was there for about eight years, eight and a half years. I had done a lot of, uh, worked in a lot of different programs ranging from trail maintenance all the way to wildland firefighting. So from 1994 to today, I have been employed with the Yakima Nation Forestry Program, moving around within the forestry program to a comfortable spot where I have been for the last 17 years. As a child growing up, I was told stories by my great-great-grandparents. They would take us up to the woods in the summer and uh, we would spend all summer up there. We weren't allowed to come back down into civilization. Any supplies that were uh, picked up, they would go down, they would leave us, they would leave us there. And then my, uh, my great-great-grandfather would give us a rifle and we were eight years old at the time and he says, go out, he goes, Go out and I want you guys to learn the area and I want you guys to hunt. But he wouldn't tell us how to hunt. It was a lesson that every, it was a lesson that he taught us to go out and learn ourselves. And if we had done anything wrong, then we were corrected. So we weren't given instructions on how to do things, we were to experience it for ourselves and then he would fine tune us after that. While there, he would also tell us stories of, of the areas that we would visit. We have many lakes, a couple of rivers, and we have Mount Adams on the west side of the reservation. And then we have the Goat Rocks, which is the northwest portion of the Yakima Reservation. And he would tell us stories of how they were created. And then he would also tell us stories about the little people. And he would also tell us stories about Bigfoot. And some of the stories that we were told were mainly of abduction, them luring children out of the woods or out of luring the children out of camps into the woods. And so Growing up, it was kind of hard to fathom why is he telling us stories like this? He doesn't want us wandering off, I'm guessing. And so even though as a child I didn't really experience a lot of known Bigfoot activity, I could have because of the different forest sounds and being up there as long as we have or were. But as I grew up, I became a skeptic from all the stories because when you're told stories as a kid, you, you're just like, all right, well, yeah, I believe it. No, no, I don't believe it. And that kind of builds, builds up into you over the years. And then when I started my forestry career, I was in one of the Bigfoot hotbeds at that time and uh, down, down in Carson, Washington. And then there was this guy, and he lived on the outskirts of Carson and would always share with the locals the activity that was happening around his place. And we'd hear those stories and we're like, yeah, he's just a crazy old guy. You know, he's, 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 he's imagining all of this. And then, you know, because I was working in the woods and I've been, a, you know, like I said, I, as a child, I grew up in the woods. I was taught a lot of things, how to hunt, how to fish, how to gather berries. And so, and then, and then the terrain. Trying to put all those stories together was kind of like, no, 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 no. I, I remained the skeptic. And throughout my forestry career with the um, Gifford Pinchot National Forest, I never had any experiences that really stood out, but then when 
I started recollecting what was happening to me when I started my employment with the Yakima Reservation. I thought back to a couple of the things that happened with the Gifford, at the Gifford Pincho, where I had heard something knocking on trees. And I thought, you know, it was a woodpecker or something like that, but whatever it was, was following me because it got to the point where I was able to work by myself. Trusted me enough to go out, not get lost, return back safely. And at that time, nobody could keep up with me because of my age and, you know, it was a wildland firefighter, so I was in, in really good condition. So I would work these uh, strenuous areas. And so one day I was sent into this place and I had to mark a timber sale. And I was given a, a, um, I was given a, a, a staple gun. So I took the staple gun and I would staple or like bang on the trees as I was putting these uh, uh, tags up. And then when I got down into the creek bed, that's when I started noticing what was going on around me. And then it got quiet. I didn't hear anything, but I didn't associate anything at that time. It just got quiet. And then I just kept working. And then I would hear something banging on a tree or whatever further away. And then I, you know, like I said, I thought it was a woodpecker and I just kept working. But as I kept going, it was just quiet. And I just felt this sense of fear in me that I've never had before working in pr other areas or working with other people. And then when I got up to the top, to the road, I was like, oh, I'm done. And then I walked out and then I started feeling a lot better that, that whatever was, whatever I experienced down there was, was uh, not following me out. And uh, still a skeptic at the time because I didn't know. And then a few years later, working for the Yakima Nation, then that's when everything started happening. My first experience with them was in 1996. Again, I was working alone. I was, uh, I'm a timber cruiser and I collect timber data, meaning the, the sizes and the health of the trees. And uh, so we put plots um, to um, not go out and count every tree. So, so we put these plots in. And as I arrived in this area, it was late fall, almost early winter. There was no snow on the ground at that time. And I started working, I was into it for about an hour. And then I got into this creek and then started working up the slope on the other side. And then I kept hearing something off to my right. As I would go around and measure the trees within my, my uh, plot, I kept hearing off, something off to my right. And then not, what I mean by hearing is like something was moving and I kept looking in that direction and I couldn't see it. And then as I finished up that plot, then that's when it vocalized at me. It made this and bears, you know, cougars, anything that growls in the woods could have made that sound. But what made this different from hearing those sounds was this sound was projected at me and I felt vibration go through like a wave go through my body when this sound was projected at me. And I put my hands up and it, it, my, my whole body was tingling. And I was like, I'd never felt like this before. So I just finished up my plot. I had to go 300 feet to my next one, set that one up. And then as soon as I put everything down on the ground and was getting ready to measure, that same sound came from my right side again. From the, from the west side of me, because I was going south. And I was like, what is that? Because it did it twice on this go around. And then I couldn't see over there. 
I couldn't see over there, so I dropped down to the ground because of the limbs. I couldn't see from my point of view. And um, so I dropped down to the ground where there were no limbs and it was so dark over there, I couldn't see anything, even on the ground. So I finished up, went to my next plot, and then it did it again as soon as I stopped. And I didn't know what it was. So I packed everything up, left a couple of items on the ground because I was going to come back there. And then I was like, I'm out of here. Reading books over the years of different researchers saying put your hands up in the air to show that your hands are clear, that you're not carrying anything, any type of weapon. So I put my hands up and then I said, I'm out of here. I said, you can have this area. I'll be back in a couple of weeks to finish this up. So I continued south. My truck was off to the north. You know, instead of doing the direct route back because I knew something was over there. I was going to take the long, wide way around. <laughs> and I was working my way back to the truck. Not, I didn't have any sense that I was being followed. And then when I saw my truck, I was like, ah, I was relieved. And four, five steps away from my truck, something pushed a tree over from that creek bed area. And I was like, I put my hands up further in the air and I said, I'm out of here. I'm, <laughs> I won't be back for a while. And I jumped in the truck, I started up and I hightailed it out of there and I got out. And when I got back to the office, I met up with my other coworkers and I told them about what was going on up there. I says, I need help. I need help finish this up. I don't want to go back in there by myself. And once I told them the story, the event that had happened that day, they was like, no, no, you can go back in there by yourself. So they, they told me about their experiences, different places, and they said, we know what's there, and you can, you can finish that by yourself. We're not going to go out there. So that was my first experience with them. And I went back two weeks later, and... I went right to the spot, nothing was messed with, and there was snow on the ground this time, and um, nothing. I didn't feel anything else out there, nothing projected anything to me, nothing, no event. So I finished up my work as fast as I could just to get it done. I had like 12, 12 plots to finish, and I was done, and then I again cleared my hands and said, I'm out of here. I'm not coming back here for a long time, so it's yours. <laughs> I've had, in my career working with, with the Yakima Nation, I've had hundreds of experiences with them, ranging from the, the growls, the howls, the screams, having things thrown at me, having my partners chased, um, and I mean, just numerous events over the years. And the biggest, the next biggest thing that had happened to me was finding tracks in the snow. A fellow coworker was with me and we had a timber cruise to put in. And we had a, about a mile walk in and we were wearing snowshoes at the time. There was only one road plowed into the area. So there was little to no access to where we were going, only by foot. So we packed up, started walking in, and we devised a plan of sharing the work. I put the plots in, do a few of the measurements, leave the measurements on the trees for him, and then he comes along and he takes the heights and every, all the other data. So as I'm putting these plots in, I start noticing these huge impressions, depths in the snow, and thought, well, I'm wearing snowshoes and they're 30 inches long to support the weight that I'm carrying. And I figured somebody else has been out here. So as we leave the top out of the sun and start getting into the, the, the stream bed, off the northern slope, these 
tracks started shrinking. And I started noticing an oddity about them. It wasn't until three or four steps later that I started seeing toes. And I was like, what is going on here? And these toes in this track were 22 inches long. And the stride in the snow was right around six feet. This being was walking in the same direction I was into the creek. And then he hooked off to the left. And then when I saw that, I walked back up and I grabbed my partner. And I said, you've got to take a look at this. He goes, there's somebody else working out here. And I was like, dude, you don't even know. And I said, follow me. And so we started walking down. I left my, my stuff down there. So we started walking to the, to, uh, where the, the clearest tracks started showing up. And then as we were walking, he started noticing the same thing. He goes, oh yeah, somebody else is out here. I wonder who it was. And I was like, come on, let's go. So I get to the spot and I'm waiting for him to come down the hill. And then I didn't even have to say anything to him because my gear was right there by the track. And then he looked down and his eyes just got big. He didn't say anything. And I was like, yeah, that's what I thought it was. And then that was the end of the day, basically for work. Then we started tracking, looking at all the tracks that were in this area. So I started following this 22 inch track and he stayed up on the upper slopes. He stayed up on the upper flat of the area and he didn't, he didn't go down into the creek. So my partner went down into the creek and as I was tracking, he moved back up. He moved back up to the top. And so my partner was working down and I started following him and he started doing something weird. He started going to these trees and as you look down into the track, here's the tree and you can see his tracks on one side and you can see the toes, his left foot and his right foot and everything was iced over so they'd been there a while. And then he moved out and then he started walking and then he went to the next tree and then he started doing the same thing. And so what he was doing was he was scanning ahead all around and then moving and then going to the next tree, scanning so that he was comfortable that nothing was around him as he moved. And I followed him for a while and then my partner called me back and I went to him down into the creek bed and then he said, there's some, there's another one. And so we measured that track at 18 inches and we started following that one up the creek bed. And then I decided, well, I'm going to go down the creek to see where it came from. And then as I moved down away, cause he was going north and I was moving my, he was going yeah, northwest and I was going southeast. And then I started seeing these little tracks, about 80 inches long. And I was like, wow, what, what's going on here? And then it was like mother, as I was putting all this together, father, keep an eye out for the family unit down below. The mother watching out for the little one. Because when she would move up the creek, you didn't see the little track. It broke away from the mom and then went up the other hills on the opposite hillside and it meandered around all over the place through the trees. And then he, you could see where it would, there was logs and then there was like a springboard effect. And you could see the track as he walked up that, that, that tree and then bounced up and down off of it. And then you could see where he jumped off of it. And then he meandered down and met up with the mom. And then they walked up and then he broke away again. And then he would do the same thing. It was just like a little kid playing. And uh, he meandered around through all. And so that's why we never saw the little, little track walking with the mom all the time because he would break away from her and then meet up with her up the creek. And then he would, that's what he kept doing. And then finally, 
as everything started leveling out, then all three of them had met up together and then they walked to the northwest. And then that's when we stopped following it. And then that's when we got weirded out. We were into this for about two and a half hours going through all of this, you know, on the ground. And then we was like, started getting the, the heebie-jeebies, you know, and decided, well, it's time to get out of here. Something with a track that this, this big and another track that's this big and then something like this is, I don't know what's going on out here, but uh, we, uh, we were parked in two different locations. I was parked here and he was parked further to the east. So I could walk directly to the south and get back to the truck. And then he had to go down and then across. So when I cut across, then that's when I started seeing more of the tracks, all three of them. They were up on the flats and they were everywhere. And then I looked off to my left and then I saw an area that was about 15 feet long and about eight to nine feet wide. And what was strange about this was that I could see vegetation. And what had happened was is that what it looked like was that these things had pushed the snow out away and created this berm from pushing the snow out. And there was just the vegetation there. And you could see the tracks, you could see, you could see where they sat, you could see where they lay down. And on the berms themselves, uh, the berms were about this tall. They were about two and a half feet tall. And you, I got down and I ran my hand over the berm. And you could, it was iced over. And just like you could feel the wrinkles in your clothes, I felt the hairs that were icing over on, on those berms. And I was just like, why, what, what is going on here? Why are they here? What are they doing? And then as I was trying to go through all that stuff that we had come across today and trying to figure out what, was, what this, what this uh, nest or clearing was, then a log truck went by. And then I thought, that's it. There's only one road plowed into here. They built this here so that they could see traffic going in and then the, all the traffic going out. So when they felt comfortable enough that all the cars were out, all the, all the activity was out, then they could move about. So when I arrived back at my truck, I called my partner and see if he was back at the truck at his and he said yes. And I said, I'm gonna do a couple of things. I said, I'm gonna go up the road and I'm gonna go back. I drove up the road at 30 or 35 miles an hour to see if I could see back where this nest was. And total darkness, unless you were looking for it, you wouldn't know it was there. And so that was my, my next biggest experience with them was seeing the personalities in those tracks of the father, the protector, of the mother watching out for the little one that was meandering all around all over the place. And if somebody were to hoax that, they would have to put a lot of detail into that. And that's how I know those were Sasquatch tracks because who would there, who else would if you're gonna put something there for somebody to find, you would put it in a known place where people are going to be. But where we were at, we were the only ones working in the area. There were no other tracks. We were the first people in there to do, our, to do the, the timber sale work. And then others would follow in after us, of course. But we were the very first ones in there. And for that to be hoaxed, they would have had to gone through a lot in order to put that detail in there. It was many years after that uh, I had collected the hairs and um, so from that point 
That's when I started collecting the data of different stories of people that were having while they were out recreating, working. And over time, we've got somewhere right around 430 stories of encounters with Sasquatch on the Yakima Reservation. So this family of three that I came across was located and seen by a number of people in the area. And what makes it distinctive is that when I interview people, I, I try to tell them, if you've seen the tracks, let me know, and let me know what the measurements were. And they would give me that 22-inch track, they would give me that 18-inch track, and then over time, you would see that 8-inch track grow. But the other two remain the same. So the, the, the little guy went from the last known report that I have went from 8 inches to 14 inches in about a four and a half to five year span. There was a story of a fire control worker working at one of the fire lookouts. The fire lookout, they are dropped off and uh, they don't want them, their, their main duty is to be there 24-7. So they don't leave a vehicle with them. They don't want them taking off. And they don't have electricity at this cabin that they're at. It's a candle and they do have um, propane for the stove for cooking and everything. And they do have a water tank that, that gets filled up. So <clears throat> the fire control worker is to remain on spot. This fire control worker that was there at the time, she would see all kinds of animals deer, cougars, bear, elk, while she was working, while she was up in the tower. And then she started hearing things. She started hearing a long distance, from a long distance, the howling, the screams. And then it started progressing into the smells, which means that it was walking around the cabin that she was living in. And she said that she always slept with the windows open and would know when something was around because she could smell the deer, she could smell all the animals. But this pungent smell that would come around every great once in a while is what caught her attention. She would always feed an elk an apple. It was one day she opened up her window blinds and poof, there was an elk standing right there and it scared her. And so she would feed it. She would take an apple. She would always feed it and she would take an apple and she would put it out on the porch. So she was rotated out with somebody else for a couple of days, for her days off, and then she was taken back up there. A couple of days after that is when something had happened to her that changed her life. She was placing the apple out, like she always does, and then she got up that morning, started making breakfast, and started getting ready for her day. Then she heard shuffling out outside, something walking around, and it's graveled. So she assumed that it was her elk. <laughs> When she told the story, she laughed because she goes, I thought it was my elk and I was going to surprise him because one day I opened up the windows and there he was and he scared me. So I was going to pay him back and I was going to scare him. So when she heard the shuffling, she went over to the blinds on the east side of the building and then she opened them up. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't her elk. It was a, it was a male Sasquatch standing about 35, 40 feet out in front of her. And when she opened the blinds, she said that he was looking up. And then caught the movement of the blinds and then focused his attention on her. And she said, I couldn't move. I was like I was stapled down to the floor. I couldn't make a sound. I, and we just stared at each other. And she gave me the description. 
and everything about him, being a male, old, size, and then the height. And then he took his right arm and then he put it up in the air like this and then he went ah! and then he turned to his left and then he started walking away and then after she watched him take a few steps then she felt relieved that she could move again and then she ran into the back room and then waited and didn't know what was going to happen next so she stayed there for a while and then she came back out Got, got the handheld radio to contact back down at the, the main agency in, in uh, Toppenish and let them know that she needed assistance and she wasn't going to say over the air. And there was a helicopter that was doing fire patrol at that time, heard her call out and they came in and it was about within five minutes, five to ten minutes, but uh, they circled around, didn't see anything and uh, uh, got a hold of her, talked, and then uh, it takes about an hour, hour and a half for somebody to get from Toppenish to this lookout. And um, when they got there, she said what was there. She informed them what, what had happened. And that's when my partner was called to go up. He was given a camera. He was given all the necessary, or he was given everything that he needed in order to collect data from whatever was there. And then when he got there, he started seeing the tracks. He started seeing everything on the ground that she had seen. And he started ribboning an area off where the clearest tracks were. And then he followed them, tracked them the direction that they had gone. And then he says, there were two other ones. And I said, well, there was only one in our phone conversation. Then I said, two others. I said, let me take a, let me take a shot at this. I go, it was a 22 inch track, it was an 18 inch track, and it was an eight inch track. And he goes, how did you know that? I said, I know about those ones. He goes, well, that eight inch track isn't an eight inch track anymore. He says, it's a 14 inch track. And I was like, oh, he's growing up, good, you know? And he's like, how do you know that? And I said, I've had run-ins with them before, so I know, I know the area. And he goes, dude, you gotta get up here, we gotta make casts. And uh, I said, well, I'll get there as soon as I can. So I'm finishing up what I'm doing to get up there to start uh, doing our data collection, and then he, I called him again, and he goes, don't worry about it. Somebody ran over the tracks. I ribboned off the area. Somebody ran over the best tracks that, that we could have casted. And I was like, ugh. And I was like, well, what happened? He goes, somebody from Wildlife showed up, drove right through the ribbon, and started hollering, I'm here to see the bear that this woman saw. <laughs> and it was like, dude, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, I heard there was a bear. And he said, no, no. He said, you just ran over the tracks that were the clearest there. That's why I had the ribbon up. And so he started explaining to him. He says, and he looks at him and goes, ah, that's a bear. And then he's just like, dude, I don't even want to talk to you. <laughs> so I know about the, about the three. So after that event up on uh, the lookout, I started collecting more information, especially the information that was coming across to me happened to deal with that one, the fa that, well, that one family unit. Because when we started tracking that one, he had a problem with his right foot. And so that kind of made him stick out from everything else. He was spotted 15 miles to the southeast of, of this area by uh, a fellow enrolled member. I was doing a conference and I was talking about the story. And then he came up to me after the conference and he said, I've seen that one. 
And you're right, he is 10 feet tall. And what made him stick out, like you said, was that he had a problem. He, he limped. And when he, I spotted him, he looked at me and then he turned away and then he started walking away. Then I saw the problem with his foot. And so when you were telling that story, I knew exactly who you were talking about. And then I had him show it me on the map, and it was 15 miles from where he was spotted uh, at the lookout. And then about a year later after that, I was collecting stories from off the reservation. And he stood out again because he had the same problem at that time, but it wasn't as pronounced. And he didn't notice the, the big limp that he, that he had, but he described the exact same person, peppered, big, male, and the limp. So and this one was about 30 miles to the south. So after collecting all these different stories, you kind of start seeing the times of the year of movement and that they do move and they do have a large range from summer to winter. And not necessarily knowing the exact migration pattern, but as you collect the data over the years and get that type of detail, then you kind of associate the one, especially this one here with the, with the, with the limp. And so he has, he, his family unit, moved around all over the reservation. As a new person getting into this, you get crazy. You want to learn more. You want to talk to more people. And that's the progression of somebody that, well, yeah, I'll read a couple of books on it and then go from there. And then some people will stop there. But as you progress, and especially somebody like me who has the greatest job in the world of being out in the woods 90% and understanding what is going on out there and collecting the stories while you're out there, you start progressing where, okay, I want to go further with this. I'm going to start buying equipment. I'm going to buy a thermal. I'm going to buy a night vision. I'm going to buy all kinds of audio recording equipment because that's what it's going to take in order to prove it to everybody else. And that's what I have seen in myself as I have grown, is that I wanted to prove this to the world. I wanted to prove this to everybody else. And then when you start getting more into this, then you start becoming the detective not only seeing the tracks, but you're looking for making sure that everything is positive about that track. The toes, the med, tar med tarsal break, everything. And then you start looking for other evidence. You're looking for scat, you're looking for hairs, you're looking for the breaks, you're looking for everything. You, if you treat everything as a crime scene now. This event that I'm going to talk about now has to do with a nest that I found while I was at work with two other people. And this looked just like a bird's nest. It looked, it was a, there was a center hole in, in it. It was on a hillside that was about 60 to 70 percent. And what built this nest had opposable thumbs. And what I mean by that is that when you start learning to hunt and tracking animals and noticing behaviors of those uh, animals that you're hunting, you see that they make beds too. But when animals make beds, they slide everything out to the bare soil. So you've got this mound of debris around it, but you have a clear down to mineral soil. So everything is, is tossed about. But what I found here was tree branches that were woven together. 
these branches were broken off tree, uh, two, three trees, whatever, in the area, and they used that as their building material. And everything was inter intertwined all the way around. So I knew what built this had thumbs, could have been a hunter, but what I found in it didn't show that it was a hunter that, that had built this for comfortability as, as a blind or a, as, a, as a post for animals to go by. I found hairs that were anywhere from an inch to about two inches long. These hairs had multicoloration to them. They were light at the bottom, and then they got brown, blonde, and then there were a few that were dark. So it was multicolored. I pulled the hairs from the intertwining of the branches, but it also incorporated a down log on the right-hand side of it. And I looked at that log, that duff log, and then I pulled more hairs out of there. And I showed them to my partners, and they were just flabbergasted. They were just out of, it was out of this world what we were looking at. And we were trying to figure out why, what made this spot interesting for him. It was timbered above him, it was kind of timbered off to the left, and small trees off here to the right, so it had cover, but it had an opening that was looking to the northeast. And then as you look through that opening, you could see the main road, which was about a mile and a half down below us. And that was the road that we parked on to get up to the hillside and come and then turn back to the north and walk out. And it made sense that could be a century looking out for, for the others. You see everything going in, you see everything going out. Let everybody else know, it's safe to move about. So I collected the hairs and took them back to my desk at work. And then people would come up to me and we start talking about it and everything and I would show it to them and they said, you should have it tested. And I was like, no, I already know. I know what built that. So I don't have to have these hairs tested. It just died, died off. Um, I just, they ended up in a pile, underneath a pile of stuff at, in my desk. And eventually just forgot about them and really never talked about it. It was, it was a few years after that I, I was told what those hairs were. I was attending a ceremony for a house cleansing. There was a, a girl who had a lot of negative energy that was affecting her, contemplating suicide. All these, all these different pressures were being put on her. And so they wanted that spirit, spirit or spirits that were in that house out of there so that it didn't affect the girl anymore. They, the parents, the adults were not feeling it, but she was. They had local church come in, do some bell ringing and, and try to drive the spirit out. But uh, if you're not powerful enough or don't understand what's in the house, then all you're gonna do is upset that spirit. So they weren't strong enough to assist that spirit there. So the next thing to do was find somebody else, go to that next level. They found somebody and they brought him in from the Midwest. This person brought his son and his wife to help him out. The instructions for the family were to blacken all the windows out. No outside light coming in, so all the windows were darkened. The next step was to cut all the power to take away the energy so that this thing would not have the strength to remain in the house. He also told us that we would be sitting on the floor. It would be total darkness. And if you were afraid of the dark, then you were, gonna, you were asked to leave. 
He also said that you're going to be visited by past relatives, past friends, people that have passed on. Don't be afraid of them. They know you. And then if they come to you, just let them talk to you, interact with them, and then the ceremony will continue. We're inviting these spirits from the outside of the house to guide. We're not, we don't want to force it out. We, kind of, we want these spirits to guide it out of the house and join them. So he cut the power to the house. It took about 20 minutes for it to completely get dark. And I could put my hand and do this with it and almost touch my nose without seeing my hand. That's how dark it was. And the first song started. And he was singing alone. And then the second song started. And if you ever see a nice calm lake and you take a rock or a pebble and you throw that rock into the lake and you see the wave projecting out and getting bigger, this is exactly how I describe what, it, what happened next. Was it like somebody took a pebble, tossed it over there, and as this man was doing his singing, his family had joined in with them, and then the drum beat. It f I could see and feel the vibration of the floor as it was coming towards me. And I didn't know what was going on. And it got closer and closer, and I could feel it shaking. I could feel the floor shaking underneath me as it got closer and closer. And then it went up behind me into the wall. And I was freaking out. And I was like, what is going on? And it kept going and going above my head. And then it just disappeared into the ceiling. And I leaned over to the person to the left. And I go, the floor's shaking? The wall's vibrating? And she goes, yes. And I was like, oh, I thought it was me. And then the next song started. And then when this song progressed, I heard something in the back room. And I wasn't quite sure what it was, but they had the drum going. I had three people singing here, but I could hear something beyond them in the back room. And I heard this And I was like, I've heard this sound before. And I'm sitting there in complete darkness, arms in front of me, and I'm listening, and I was like, I know, I've heard that. And I, I didn't say anything, I just, in my head, I went, if you are who I think you are, you'll whoop for me. And then, and I was like, oh, no way. It can't be. So the song is still going, and I can hear him coming, walking down the hallway towards us in the room. And as he got into the room, he was jumping. Boom, boom, boom. He was, he was jumping to the beat of the drum in the song. And then he was like, yeah, he was making all kinds of ruckus. And he's jumping to the beat of the drum and he's doing this in front of me. And I kept thinking, how can he be doing that in front of me when you pay somebody to do this for you and you have people show up to assist you with something like this. You offer gifts to those people to, for helping you. And then after the ceremony's over, you have a dinner. So there was food, plates of food on the floor. There was the gift offering for the people that were there. And there was about 20 people there. 
They were right there in the center of the room, everybody else sitting around the room. And this thing kept jumping, boom, 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 and I could feel the floor. And it was like, and he was almost singing to what the medicine man was doing. And as the song was ending, he went from jumping to walking back into the room where he came from, in the back room. He could feel it, boom, boom, boom. And after the song ended, there was another one, the last one, and this was more of a calming. And then he instructed that the lights come on. And when the lights came on, I was looking for the mess. I was looking for everything to be tossed about from all the jumping that he was doing. And everything was intact. Nothing had been moved. No food spilled, no nothing, nothing broken. And he was jumping right there in front of me. And I kept playing this through my head. And then the person next to me leaned over and asked, why were you touching me? And I was like, I didn't move. I had my hands in front of me and I, I sat still through the whole thing. I didn't touch you. And then she goes, well, that was weird because something touched me. And uh, so after everybody got uh, quaint, adjusted to the light again, then he started talking. And he started from this side of the room I'm sitting over here, and he started working his way around. And he goes, you had so-and-so visit you, and you had somebody visit you that was blah, 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 you haven't seen in a long time. And he kept going around to each individual person on who got visited and what experiences that they were having. And then when he got to me, his voice changed, and he goes, you, by the, you had something visit you that you shouldn't have attached to you. And so I was like, well, okay. Because you do something that you're not supposed to be doing. You chase something, you hunt something, and you collected something. And I've never met this guy in my life. And then somebody yelled out, well, he's got hair. I didn't know that person either. And so I kept thinking back, because it had been a while. I was like, yeah, I do have hair. And he goes, what you do, you shouldn't be doing. But you have something, you've collected something that they want back, he wants back. And you need to give it back to him, because if he can't get to you here, then he's gonna attach himself to somebody that you love. He's gonna attach yourself to your mate, to your children, grandchildren. He's gonna keep going until he gets back what he wants. He goes, you need to see me after this is done. I will give you the steps necessary to correct what you have done. So I went to him, talked to him, and then he gave me the steps he goes, now that I've told you this, you're not gonna be ignorant in the ways that you have before. What you do from this point on is all on you. We're gonna correct this, but what you do from here, it's all on you. You can't tell anybody when you do this. You just gather everything and then you go. It took a couple weeks to uh, gather everything and as soon as I had everything I walked out the door and I drove to the spot. I uh, had everything in a backpack because I had to hike back down into the area. I located the spot and I started doing what he told me to. Went through all the steps, the ceremony, in the very end, I offered the hairs back and I put them down on the ground. And then that's all I was supposed to do. 
then I decided, well, I'm going to ask. So I said in my head, I've given you back what you wanted. I said, are we all good? Are we clear? Everything between us, good. And I was packing things up after I said it. And then down below me, I had this, Whoa! projected towards me. And I was like, floored. And I was like, all right, well, I don't speak Sasquatch, but I'm guessing that we're good. And then I said, there you go. It's right there. I packed everything, got everything up. And then I walked back to the car, walked back to my truck, got in my truck, and I left the area. I still work in the area, but uh, ever since then, I've changed from chasing after them, collecting or whatever, to now understanding who they are and the different levels that they have while they're out there. And as I said before, people have asked, why haven't you had those hairs tested? Sent them off to be tested? I tell them I didn't have to. The story that I just told you proves that these were, of this human, he didn't want to be known. So he wanted his, his uh, property back. He wanted his identification back to him. And so that was the story that uh, has changed my life. I do, things, I do things a lot differently now. I still go out. I don't act like a, an infant out there anymore by banging on the trees and, and, and trying to coax them into something. I go out there and be amongst them. And ever since then, the way we've interacted has been a lot different. They're not aggressive with me anymore, and I'm not trying to uh, drive them away or anything. I'm in their home. They invite me into their home, and if they didn't want me there, or, and this is what I tell everybody else, if they don't want you there for whatever reason, whatever you're doing, they'll let you know that they don't want you there by the aggressive behavior. But if they're curious and you're doing something that you're always doing, doing your regular playtime, family time out there, you'll have a different interaction with them. And that's the type of interaction that I have with them now is, is just going out to the woods and, and uh, doing, uh, being respectful in their home. I didn't know what they were when I first got into this. I would read the books and they would say, you know, we all branched off from the same. And there's different branches as, as the generations progress. But to me, we're, we're all the same. And they're the purest human on this earth yet. And what I mean by that is that they're living the life as they were given it. They're out there collecting foods. They're out there not, they don't have electricity. They don't have any tools. They don't have any type of vehicles. They are living as they have from the very beginning. So they are the purest form of human left on this earth. Moving about everything to me that I've witnessed and the stories that I've collected on the reservation shows that they are, they can thought project as far as moving through dimensions. I have not seen or collected any stories on the reservation of that, but I, I don't rule that out. Before, I used to close everything off. Like, no, that's, that can't happen, no way. But now after the event with the hares, anything is possible. And unless I experience it, 
and witnessed it close firsthand, then I can't say that I've seen any of the interdimensional things. I've had some weird camera shots that have shown orbs or portals of some type, but I, 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 I really can't answer that. I stick to what I know. Over the years, working in the woods, I started noticing the tree breaks that were out and really didn't associate anything to uh, Sasquatch at, at all. Not until one day when I was working this area, area of land on the reservation and I would see a tree break and then I would advance further on the, the heading I was going and then I would come across a road. And I was like, oh, that's weird. And then when I got to the other side of the road and started working away from it, then I would notice a break here and there. And I was like, oh, that's weird. So I, have, I had a GPS unit. Crossing this road multiple times in different locations, I would see these tree breaks. And I'd start GPS in them. And then I would come across something man-made. And in this instance, it was that road. It was an old Jeep trail. And then I started seeing the pattern as the road would turn. The tree breaks would be 30 to 40 feet away from it. And so I kept playing that through my head. And then when I would start working different areas, I would also notice, notice this type of behavior, this pattern, that these tree breaks are associated to either travel routes or to something to warn that being, that human, that there's something else ahead of it that he needs to be cautious of. So I, I started playing around with this in different locations and it, it, was, it was spot on everywhere I had gone. Anything man-made, human-made, whether it be a road, whether it be a, a horse corral, an old structure, there were these breaks. So I took this off reservation. I used to be with the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, the BFRO, and I started playing around with that while I was out there with them. And sure enough, the same things started happening. Camping areas, you could see the tree breaks in certain spots. And then as my knowledge grew of this, then I started to see what was going on. And like I said, the, the advancement of a researcher as he starts collecting this information, this intel, you want to make sure that it's, it's, it's good, it's accurate. I took a trip about two months ago with my wife. And uh, we went to an area that we've never been in before on our, our, our two-week trip. We stopped off at gravel pits. We stopped off at known camping areas because of the campfire rings there. I would set up camp, make sure that we were comfortable, and then I would break away from camp and I would walk into the trees. And I would look for these tree breaks to see if my theory was, was good, was if it was accurate. When I walked into certain areas, I started seeing the breaks. And then, as I started doing this, you know, people see at their eye level when they're doing things. You can't do that while you're out there because you're dealing with Bigfoot, that Sasquatch, that is not just four and a half, five feet tall at your eye level. You're looking at things that are eight, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve feet tall. So you may be seeing breaks at different heights, but when you're looking at something and you say, well, I don't know what this is, you've got to imagine yourself taller and then look. You've got to imagine yourself taller and then look. Because that throws you off. You've got to be a Bigfoot when you're out there, and then you've got to put yourself in their place. And that's what I've learned to do 
And everywhere that I've gone, I would see these breaks around known camping areas that people frequented. And then I knew if any type of activity was going to happen, that that activity was going to be isolated to this area because that's where they would come in from, know that I need to stop right here, observe the people or whoever, what, whatever activity is going on over here. And you wouldn't see it anywhere else. It was always isolated to this one spot. I had a girlfriend years ago. I, I, put, this, I put this theory to test. Set up camp. I didn't tell her what was going on. We just went for a walk. And then I started seeing these tree breaks along the roadside. And then I started seeing them on this side of the tent. So I was like, in my head, they're going to come from this direction and this direction. So to isolate where we were at, to keep them from coming to the tent, I put tables off on this side so that they couldn't approach from that, that direction. We turn in for the night and about two, two and a half hours later, we're laying down. We had two girls with us and we started hearing something outside. And then we saw the shadow as it was walking from the direction I knew that they were gonna come from. And then it came over to the tent and it tapped the top, top of the tent and you could see his shadow off here, this direction. And then he walked away, went over to the awning and you could, I placed some stuff, I put a table on the outside of the awning and he started boobing stuff on, on the, on the table and you can hear him shuffling things around and not violently like a, like a bear or anything else would be scrounging through things. It was just carefully moving things and you can hear his steps as he was moving about. And then he walked off. My girlfriend said, how do you attract these things? I was like, I don't attract them. I just, learned and she goes are they around everywhere I said no I said they just happened to be around here at the time we're here she goes how did you know that they were kind of come from that direction I said well, well when we were out for our walk that's what I was doing I was looking for the spots that they would come in and that's why I put the tables and everything else over to block that off so that they would come in from this, this direction. She goes, next time we go camping, we're camping at a campground. We are not camping out in the middle of nowhere. I want to be around people. <laughs> As a forester or an everyday person, you people that drive out to the woods, walk out in the woods, higher elevations where the snowpack is heavy you can see where the pressure of snow over time will crack a, a tree top and bend it over. And you can tell by the pressure that it, it's a long period of time before that tree break or that tree points in a direction. And you don't get that, that, that pressure that these things apply. So you've got a, a steady amount of pressure but when the Sasquatch is marking its territory, you get this violent and you see the snap and the amount of force put into that snap. And so that's the difference between weather, another tree falling down, and a tree break. I always look to make sure that what I'm looking at is an actual break because like I said, it could have been the force of another tree landing on it and that's what I look for on the ground when I'm looking at these to make sure that nothing else caused it. But when you see that force put into that break and it's something that we can't do, we can, something about this diameter of your finger, we can easily snap. But tree breaks can range from that, 
one inch to three, four inches. And that's the strength that, these, that they have. And people always say, well, why do they have superhuman strength? I said, they don't have superhuman strength. I said, we have to go to the gym. We have to condition, we have to lift weights in order to maintain health. We have automobiles, we have tools, we have everything to put ourselves in the condition that we need for whatever. These humans, these beings live out there. They don't have no automobiles. They don't need to work out. They're consistently working with their hands. They're consistently walking their home, their areas. That's how they are, are adapting out there. They're, they're living that life. And that's how, let's see here, how can I put this? They're living their life the way they know how. And that's how they get the strength that they, they have, just by their own human natural ability. A few years ago, I did come across one. I didn't actually see it. The, the first time that we passed by it, we were in a work vehicle. This was a central part of the reservation, and my coworker that was with me had had experiences with Sasquatch before. And so we're riding in this truck, and then off to the right-hand side, he saw something. And he was stumbling through his words to try to get me to stop. And so I stopped, he told me what was going on, and I was like, okay, well, we backed up. So as we were backing up, there was something on the right-hand side where he was at, where he was looking. And then I looked off to my left, and then he goes, there it goes. And then I turned to the right, and what I saw had already dropped its arm and then took off to the left and then started running away from us. What I saw was about eight to eight and a half feet tall. Lean, muscular, dark, and moving really fast. As it was running away, I jumped on top of the truck to get a better view of it. And then as it was moving away from us, all I saw was the back after that and the head. And then he banked off to, to my right and then I could see the side profile from like basically from the underneath the arms up because of the trees uh, that had gone through. And then I could see it moving. I could see his head going through the, off to the right like that. And then he was out of view after that. So I took off after it and I started tracking where it was going. And then after a while then I, I went back to my partner and then we started doing some me measurements. We started measuring the stride length, we started measuring the height. The way we measured the height off of it is that I grabbed a piece of wood and then I put it up over my head and then that's how we got the height estimation off of it. And we carry uh, tapes with us and so that's, we measured a, a stride that was in between nine and a half to almost 11 feet between each step as it was on its full run. But when he first took off, it was five feet. When he turned and started increasing his speed, that's when his stride length had increased. And that was, that was the only time I uh, actually got to witness one. I'd been close to him, but not to the point where I wanted to see one again. On a reservation, with the number of uh, encounters that have, that have happened to the enrolled members that go up, also spotted by Fish and Wildlife, Yakima Nation Fish and Wildlife uh, patrol people. And sometimes they'll talk to me about events, but most of the time they will not because they don't want the exact locations and everything else shared. That is also true with some of the loggers or heavy equipment operators up there as well. There are a few out there that don't want them to be seen out there as well. Um, there's been 
of people that have graded the roads that would see the tracks cross the road or walk down the road as they're clearing it and then they would go off they would take the time to brush all the brush the area out so that the tracks aren't found by anybody traveling the roads so there are people out there that will protect them so that they're not found and the reason I believe that they they do this is is to respect them so that they're not bothered uh, there are logging companies that are up there for long periods of time and if they know the person and I'm and they do have memories of, of and they recollect who's who's in the area I had a guy who came to me and he was uh, a maintenance person for all the logging equipment. He would drive up in the same vehicle early morning hours, three o'clock in the morning. He actually seen a female and two little ones. And every day that he would go up, he would see the same female cross in almost the exact same spot. Then he would continue on his route, do what he was supposed to do, and then go home. Well, his truck acted up had to leave it at the shop, took a different truck up there, and then he started getting pelted with rocks early in the morning hours, four o'clock in the morning. And then he got back in the truck, didn't like the feeling that he was getting, went back down to the shop and told him, you guys get my truck going because I'm not taking this one back up there. So they repaired his truck. A couple of days later, he'd drive back up there, nothing. They knew who he was, they knew the vehicle, and they didn't bother them. So they know over time who they can trust. Everything that I've shared with you doesn't make me an expert. I don't claim to be an expert. I don't want to make people out there who are skeptics believers. That's not why I'm here. That's not. I'm only here to share everything that I know about them, everything that I've experienced. You can take, take it for whatever it's worth, but the things that I've experienced also took me a long time to understand. The stories about the hair, the stories about the screams, all come from experience. And that's all I'm here to do is share my experiences with you to make you understand or to show you that when we leave our homes to go out or if they, you know outside of our homes be respectful of them because they do exist they are there because I've shared m most of my life with them I've experienced a lot of things to get me to this point where I wasn't out there to prove them to everybody else. I proved them to myself and that's all I needed to do. And that's all I'm here to do is share my, share my life with you.